G'day folks. That's a really nice cockatoo going off somewhere. Oh, I saw it! I've been studying geography at a university level for about four years now and it's really made me aware of the human impact that is on everything and the moral applications and implications of the anthropocentric views of humanity. All animal rights are obviously made by humans. Just as you can't step into another person's shoes, you can't step into the shoes of another being and understand things from an animal perspective, which is obviously why humans anthropomorphize. And that's something that as human beings we can't step past, but I think we need to ask a lot more frequently instead of what is just beneficial for us as a human species, what is beneficial for the entire geography we share the earth with, plants, animals, landscapes, biozones, ecosystems, etc. I read such a fascinating report the other day. It was about the commodification of non-humans in an agricultural setting. In this case, the fruit fly. Something that I hadn't thought about, and I consider myself an animal rights activist, I would love to be an entomologist in the future. I absolutely love insects, I love bugs, I love spiders. And even I didn't think about this part of agriculture in a sense of itself. It was always flies and how they affect livestock, flies and how they affect crops and not flies and the rights and responsibilities of flies, the rights for all living organisms, including flies, to take up space and place and have a right to live and exude their instinct. When I was reading this report, I just found it so incredibly fascinating. The emphasis as a culture on fast production and mass production consumerism is something that has seen farming and agriculture consistently compacted and sectionized just more and more frequently. And most people think about this in regards to factory farming, which obviously strips animals of their rights to space and place and ability to use their instinct. Karl Marx has an incredible philosophy, in my opinion, on that anything that is used for money is commodified to the extent where its value is only based on how much it can create and how fast. And when you think about that, you can start seeing it in absolutely every area of the economy. You can see it in modern day slavery, in how fast fashion works. You can see it in agriculture, you can see it in business models. It's so prevalent. And this model really puts the existence of animals in peril, but not just the regular animals that are being farmed that you think about. So in this report called Living Without Flies, it is looking at the rights of the Q fly or fruit fly in the tri-state exclusion zone in Australia. The report starts with the author travelling and they come to the exclusion zone. They see the bin where you have to get rid of all of your fruit when you enter it. People attempt to keep flies out of this zone because of the crops within and the damage that the fruit flies can do to it. There are heavy fines for bringing fruit inside. I'm not sure if anyone saw the report that I think someone was fined $20,000. Maybe it was $2,000, but I think it was $20,000 for bringing quite a quantity, I would assume, of fruit inside the fruit fly exclusion zone. So there are bins before you go in and Catherine Phillips, who wrote the report in 2012, argues that this type of biosecurity measure creates conflict between people and animals, and in this case people and insects particularly, which are already completely, in my opinion, undervalued by humans. They have incredible brain capacity, some of them. They also have intrinsic rights to place and space and to live their life, in my opinion. 
The flies naturally continue to travel in and out of the fruit fly exclusion zone, even when fruit isn't brought in. But if they're found within the zone, they are eradicated. And so this is looking at the life of flies as something that's helpful when it's working for humans in areas such as pollination and something that is a pest and is completely devalued and eradicated when it's working against humans. This changes the environmental landscape and it affects humans and animals and the culture-nature divide is something that we talk about in geography so extensively and it's the concept that a lot of people believe that culture now has dominance over nature. A lot of people also argue that it doesn't and I'm one of those people because nature provides us with culture, it provides us with the tools to enact culture, our social settings, our urbanization, our buildings, etc. And to be able to live in an environment where we're happy, where we're alive, we need nature to be constantly feeding into that. And culture then affects nature, it shapes it. Culture plants trees in places where they wouldn't usually be. Culture brings animals into different countries. And it's really a feedback loop with both. The culture-nature divide in instances like this is heightened because we're not seeing ourselves as humans as part of nature. We're seeing ourselves separate and above nature and humans have a real dominance culture over nature which is what can be seen here. It goes as far as the language that we use. So when we eradicate these flies we call it management. That's a word with positive associations and I understand that all animals have different brain capacities, different levels of thought, feeling and emotion, but I would also argue that intrinsically all animals have a right to life, space and place. So it's something really interesting to look at. What I'm trying to get at here is that farming and agriculture doesn't just commodify bigger animals, the animals that are in farms, it affects the entire landscape and I personally do believe that to have the amount of infrastructure we have today, to have the amount of ability that we have to such a good education, the ability to have poets and artists all rely somewhat on the fact that we are a world that is producing faster and there is more time for these things but I think the real question is at what cost it's at because it's not just affecting large animals it's affecting smaller animals it's affecting the entire environment and it's compromising the rights of other beings and to what level we're comfortable with that and that we can change the agricultural situation so that this isn't happening the commodification of other animals which strips them of their rights isn't happening but that we can still produce to a level which we need is something that is a balancing act and at the moment we're so overproducing cosmetic standards on food is ridiculous chickens only lay eggs for six months which is their fastest egg laying period and then they're killed it's such a balancing act of being true to yourself being true to what you believe in your moral standpoint and also trying to put yourself in the shoes of these other beings that have had their rights compromised and what you're gonna do to stop that happening in the future and stop that happening now because environmentalism and activism is often always talked about as a future issue when it's something that needs to happen now we can't look at it as something that's going to happen in the future because that really takes the emphasis off of it, I think. This biosecurity measure about these fruit flies makes the assumption that not only is it possible to live without these flies, it's important and the only way of going about agriculture, which just isn't the case. This makes commercial trade culture the only imagined way of having a workable future that's profitable to humans. What you can do about this, growing yourself in your garden is such a fantastic resource for bringing both 
biodiversity, especially if you're growing native plants or native fruits and vegetables back into your garden, into your state. Also being really conscious about where food comes from, reading up on the culture nature divide, thinking deeply and assessing moral views on it. All of those things are really useful in creating a world where the rights of animals aren't compromised for humans. Thanks for watching.